Okay, question about, yes. about the following week. If you're not having um, noon, noon, noonday prayer, are you having uh, noon 15 lectionary Bible study? Excellent question. The answer would be no. I hadn't thought of that yet, but thanks for thinking ahead for me. I'm clearly on top of it since vacation. <laughs> yes, there will be new, no lectionary Bible study because that will be neck deep in uh, Latino ministry discussion. Um, good call. Thanks, Carolyn. I'll, I'll put a message uh, about that out to people as well. Um, so let me turn on the show here. <laughs> There we go. And we'll go ahead and share the screen. I will cut all of this out of the video before I post it. Hopefully I'll remember to do that. Uh, there we go. All right. And we're in session 21. How long it's been. The second law in obedience to God. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning. Drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, love uh, this collect, uh, a common collect that we have in the daily office particularly because it um, articulates to me one of the gifts the Anglicanism has to offer to broader Christianity, whereas some versions of Christianity tend towards legalism, so we have to kind of do all these things right or God's going to smite us, you know, or other versions tend to fall towards kind of an antinomian, uh, antinomianism, whereas you're going to screw up, but it's okay, nothing really matter, God loves everyone. Um, the Anglicanism and its traditional articulation of Christian spirituality uh, has the idea that God, the grace of God does not only forgive sins, but the grace of God enables us to follow the law uh, more faithfully, um, which to me has always been much more appealing than the idea that God kind of waves a hand over my head and kind of makes my driving tickets disappear. Um, the idea that God actually helps me maybe start to live a little better, to drive a little more faithfully in my life. Um, so I thought this would be a good, uh, good uh, prayer for us as we uh, continue to work through the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, so to remind you, the three texts we're focusing in, particularly for new people like Barbara, um, the version of the Bible I'll be using most of the time is the uh, New Oxford Annotated Bible, uh, the NRSV version with the Apocrypha, which has excellent study notes. It's the best study Bible out there, really, to be honest, in my opinion. Excellent, excellent book, uh, Bible, and we'll, we use that as one of our key texts. Also, a great kind of one volume short commentary, book by book on the Bible is Fee and Stewart's How to Read the Bible Book by Book. So that, that's a good kind of, just to help you get an overview of what's going on in various books. It's inexpensive, small text. And then um, the specific text I'm using as we work through Deuteronomy is from the Brit Olam series, uh, Sherwood's uh, commentary, which is actually Leviticus numbers in Deuteronomy, though I'm only using the Deuteronomy portion for uh, this text that we're, this uh, section that we're doing uh, tonight um, and over these, uh, this current session of the, uh, of the class. So to remind you all, review, think back so, so long ago, a whole, what, two weeks. Uh, do you recall anything about the structure of the book of Deuteronomy? Anything sticking in your head from what this book looks like from a structural standpoint? I wrote down the beginning is about the retelling of the journey. Right, there's a retelling of the journey. Good, good. What else do you remember structurally? Uh, and then there's the restatement of the law. Yes. And then I don't know what's next. <laughs> then the third, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a book that consists primarily of three addresses from Moses. One, uh, a retelling of the journey in chapters one through four, a restatement of the law, verse uh, chapters five through 28, and then the, the, the third and final address in chapters 29 through 30. And then there's a concluding narrative as jo okay. Joshua is installed, the law is delivered, and Moses dies. And the more I, I was hoping we could get through the rest of, De of Deuteronomy tonight, however, as I worked, on preparing for tonight, 
um, I realized we're not even gonna get past the second address. So, um, you know, the best laid plans and all of that. I found too many things I wanted to talk to you all about. So, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Uh, do you remember when this book was, book was likely compiled? You know, did Moses sit down and write this thing or did he have a stenographer perhaps? I and mean, then remember our ideas about that. Wasn't it when they came back from Babylon? Excellent. Yes, yes. Likely in the seventh century, representing the return from Babylon and the reforms of Josiah that we get in Second uh, Kings twenty-two through twenty-three. Excellent. Good job, Barbara. Nice. Look at that. She's doing her homework and studying. You get two points. Uh, <laughs> Input of the Hebrew Bible points can be converted into um, nothing. They're worth. <laughs> and then Sorry we for my crown. Right. Yeah. And then we talked a little bit about the story as it's retold at the beginning of the book. And the, the remember, there's a chiasm going on, if you remember that, um, with the, the summons to take the, to enter the land, the people organize. Um, they have a war where they are on where they do not follow God's command not to enter due to their faithlessness. Um, then there's a march of conquest. Then God has them go in, but they do succeed because that God is finally with with them. The land is finally distributed in the Transjordan, um, and then the, a new summons to take the promised land. So it's just kind of, it's a really lovely kind of taking the whole of the wilderness journey and kind of condensing it into these three chapters is what the text is trying to do and using that chiasm to emphasize that what's most important is whether or not the people have had loyalty, um, trust in God's promise that God has given to them about uh, the promised land. Uh, and uh, what do we do with the genocide? This is the real, I think, one of the real questions of Deuteronomy, uh, of Joshua as well. And we talked a little bit about it uh, last week, uh, not last week, but in our last session. Um, and I, I sent you, because uh, I couldn't help myself. I was trying to be like, what are good things to give you? So I, I, instead, I, I told you I'd send you one article and instead I sent you four. Um, <laughs> so you had a lot of things to possibly read. Um, and... Uh, if you remember, the first article is kind of just like a basic, to me, kind of rundown of, of approaches. And it was, it was a book review, but it's one of those book reviews that does a really good job because it's less about reviewing the book and more about reviewing what the book is doing and how well or not the book engages with that. So I thought that was a good first review. And then I gave you three kind of more scholarly um, articles uh, from uh, ATLA, the, uh, the Association of Theological Library Association. There's two associations in there. Can't remember what ATLA stands for, but ATLA, which is a, a journal database for religious um, uh, journals. And the first one was a, 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 an article that pretty much said, this is horrible and why we, you know, committed genocide against indigenous people in America. So like, this sucks, which is like helpful in the sense that that's a really good like critique, less helpful. So like, what do we do with that? The fact that that's in the Bible? Um, but I thought that was a good uh, article to give you kind of to raise some of the questions. And then the following two were kind of two different approaches to kind of engaging this question and how we handle these, these genocidal, seemingly genocidal texts that exist in Joshua. Um, so I'm not going to get into all of the details of those articles, um, because in the end, this is a hard question in biblical studies and people wrestle with this. They debate over this to this day, obviously. Um, and so really like, if you want to get into the weeds of it, like read the various articles and kind of debate, you know, in your own head. But I, I tonight, I did want to just cover briefly kind of some of the basic things I would want to say about this, largely drawing from that first article, but then also some of the insights from the other ones. Um, so first off, we need to acknowledge that there's not a silver bullet here, like one perfect solution that makes sense of divine violence in the biblical text, particularly in the text of Deuteronomy. Uh, and we've, we've been able to do that with some other difficult texts, if you remember. So Barbara, as you've probably seen in the presentations before, often when we have a hard text, I throw up this keep calm and stay in the text graphic, like don't freak out, just keep reading. This is one of those places where we can do that but the answer is not as clear as I think it is in some of the other troublesome texts. So I think we need to wrestle with it a bit more. Um, and I think that there are some ways into these questions, but none of them are, to me at least, fully satisfactory. So there's a wrestling, I think, involved in these texts that we have to do as Christians, particularly as Christians who recognize the way these texts have been used to support 
some pretty horrible atrocities in the past. So I think that wrestling is important. Um, one idea, one of the common explanations is that the, the, the genocide is kind of reflecting the, 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 a, a primitive expression of Israel's religious consciousness. So they're understanding that God always looks like you. you always, that's one of my favorite. If, if you find that God hates the same people you hate, you need to kind of re-examine your understanding. Because all of us, right? Like, if you're like, who does God hate in this world? Like, what does God against? It's like, it's everything I'm against, right? Surely. God must, I mean, I have excellent opinions. Surely God agrees with me. Um, and so the idea being that in the same way you and I do that today, that the people of Israel in ancient times are doing the same thing, that they're imagining God responds to their enemies the way they would respond to their enemies. And, and over time, their consciousness kind of develops and they understand that maybe murdering everyone is not the solution they thought it were. So that's kind of one of the, the basic under, ways of kind of getting around or kind of working through these texts. But problem is, is there's not an evolution. Some of the more violent texts we have in the Hebrew Bible, particularly, particularly related to the conquest, are actually generally understood to be written later in history. So it's like the people got worse in their understanding of violence. So um, the more violent texts are written, you know, as we've said, after the Babylonian exile, as opposed to earlier texts that aren't nearly as genocidal. So that's not a very good answer to these problems. Um, We've also, an, another thing you'll often hear in, in commentaries is what we just got to read it through the lens of Jesus. This is that Christocentric reading of the text. And if we do that, then we can adjudicate what's of God and what's not of God, um, really. Um, the problem of that is that really what you're doing is you're having to create these hypothetical constructions to confirm your own theological presuppositions. So like we would presuppose that genocide is bad. And so now I'm literally going to invent an idea of what happened so I can continue to believe what I believe about genocide, which of course I'm comfortable with because I'm pretty sure genocide is bad, but as, a, as an exegetical approach, you could see how that would be slippery slope that you just wind up going to the Bible and whatever you disagree with, you kind of come up with your own answer for. Um, so for example, uh, God wanted the conquest, but he wanted the conquest to be nonviolent. And ancient people, they, they just didn't understand that. And so they were violent, but that was not what God really wanted. Well, there's no evidence for that in the biblical text. I mean, it's a lovely idea, but, and you can believe that, I guess, sure. But you have to understand that you're making things up because you're uncomfortable with how God is portrayed. And that's probably, in general, not the best exegetical approach to biblical text. So not as helpful. Um, so the other reality of both of these is they have unpleasant whiffs of Marcionism and anti-Semitism. So the canon of scripture, as you may or may not know, was not kind of, it's not like Jesus's disciples walked around with a KJV New Testament and Psalms, right? The, the Gideon's Bible, like that, that didn't exist. Uh, the canon of scripture wasn't fixed until around the fourth century. And there was a lot of debate about what should and should not be included in the canon of scripture. The first person to come up with a list of what was actually authentic Bible and what was not authentic Bible is someone that we would now characterize as a heretic, Marcion who uh, his, his version of authentic New Testament scripture was basically Paul and a pretty edited version of Luke. And the rest of it he thought was the worst. Um, and he also believed the God of the Old Testament was evil and clearly not the God of Paul and the God of the gospels. Um, which oddly enough, um, if you talk to the average Christian who's not trying to be caught in, in heresy, they will probably ascribe some kind of a Marcion view of the Bible. You'll hear them say, oh, well, the God of the Old Testament, well, the God of the New Testament, which is a heresy, because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And this will be one of the kind of hobby horses you'll see me ride throughout this course is that the God, is, that there's, there's judgment and justice and vengeance in both the Old and the New Testament. And at the same time, there's an overwhelming abundance of grace in both. So we don't want to be Marcionites. We don't want to be heretics. That's been condemned. And so let's avoid that. There's also a little anti-Semitism uh, that gets involved in some of, well, you know, those ancient Jewish people didn't really understand God. And we, of course, as enlightened Christians do. Um, which... I mean, I'm clearly a Christian and not a Jew, and so I, I'm comfortable ascribing Christian faith contrary to Jewish faith. 
but there's a dismissal of Judaism involved in that, which is unsettling. Particularly, there's a dismissal of the way modern Judaism continues to wrestle with and understand these, these texts. And so we, we generally, th those other ways, those aren't helpful ways of getting at it because they, they lead you down uncomfortable paths and they are, are, are done within frameworks that we would generally say are not theologically orthodox and are also like kind of evil. <laughs> so this is where like Nazism came from. So let's not be Nazis, I think is a good way of approaching the Hebrew Bible. That could be our slogan for introduction to the Hebrew Bible and introduction <laughs> to the Hebrew Bible, let's not be Nazis. <laughs> let's all work on that. Um, now, what's amazing, and this is why I would have thrown out my keep calm and you know remain in the text graphic, is when you read the text carefully in Deuteronomy, you can see that there are joints in tension. You can see the, uh, the at one place is the pronouncement of complete destruction, and then an acknowledgement that these people were not actually destroyed. And so Deuteronomy is not monolithic in its understanding of how we handle the existence of the indigenous people in the land. And Deuteronomy itself is clearly wrestling with this question. And to me, I, as I always find most helpful when, I make, when there's difficult texts in scripture, almost always the difficulty arises from an unwillingness to see the, the multiplicity of views in the Bible. We, we, we find text difficult because we see one thing that's scary and we fixate on it. We don't realize that, yeah, there's that scary thing and then there's this thing that disagrees with it and this thing that disagrees with it and this thing that says you're all wrong, clearly. And, and, and the more faithful approach to scripture is not to find kind of the one right thing, but is instead to look at those tensions, look at those joints that exist in the narrative and look at how ancient people are trying to understand God in their own history. And what can that teach us as we kind of wrestle with these same questions today? Um, all of that to say, one of the more helpful scholarly approaches would be to say that these commands about genocide, they're likely hyperbolic. Remember, these weren't written at the time of the conquest. These were not, you know, parchments that people were carrying around as they slaughtered men, women, and children. Centuries after the fact, they were thinking about the conquest in this ways, because the, 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 the stress is in the importance of keeping distance from the other nations because of the importance of an unadulterate, unadulterated commitment to God. And you see that if you want to flip real quick to uh, Deuteronomy 7, which is kind of skipping ahead of what we're doing tonight, but I think does a good job of showing you what I mean when I say that there are um, text, I mean, that there are joints there are, are uh, that you can see in the text itself. So Deuteronomy 7, uh, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your way. How would we intermarry with them if we murdered them all? You see the problem? So the, 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 the hyperbolic ideal of destruction is already acknowledged to be false um, because they're already imagining that they're still remaining in the land after the war and that you might wind up getting hitched uh, to, to a Jebusite of all things. Oh, the worst. Can't bring a Jebusite home to, do, to, to dinner. Uh, guess who's coming? That's a guess who's coming to dinner, Doug. That's only for the classic lovers of film among us. Um, so, uh, so it's much more about that. This, my guess is that hyperbolic rhetoric is much more about the importance of that unadulterated commitment to God um, than it is about an actual reflection of genocidal practices that existed in the Hebrew Bible. Um, does that make sense? It's kind of a a thumbnail sketch of the issue, and like I said, it. I can't really fix the issue, but I, I hope that at least gives you some of the of the nuances. Thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah, I think I find it almost more disturbing that they would idealize what didn't really happen as the most desirable yeah. solution. Um, and it makes could that be could possibly because they were 
they had just come out of uh, being under Babylonian and Assyrian conquest, and those guys were pretty rough on people. And and maybe they, it's like if you've been in an abusive relationship or something, you know, you you have a warped sense maybe of what is the right way to deal with people in conflict. And, and, and that, Barbara, is one of the one of the very compelling scholarly arguments as well is that in some ways they're parroting the Babylonian approach to conquest um, and, 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 and how vicious that was. And in other ways, it's kind of a what might have been sort of thing. You know, if only we, we would have nipped this in the bud back then, we wouldn't wind up with all of these problems we wound up with. Um, whether or not that's actually true or not, of course, it's another question. But there is this, uh, and that's why I think what, what's actually going on is not a commandment of genocide from God. But I think the people are wrestling with how do we square our experience with God with our experience of the power of ba- and the might of Babylonian conquest with the failures that we had as a nation that caused the loss of the land and the loss of our religion um, with God's promises, like how do we like, how do we believe all of these things at the same time? And and I think part of it is this historical reimagining of, well, what if we'd done this? What if we? What if this is what God really wanted? We just weren't faithful in that all along. Um, it, 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 which is like as I've said, like is is not the only answer given. Other texts give different answers for why the the exile happened, why the failure, and 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 they don't presuppose a failure of genocide. So. I think it is that wrestling with the contemporary reality and how do we understand the historical as well. Father Jared? Yeah. Uh, what um, has perplexed me is that this is the first violence that we've experienced in, in reading the, the Hebrew Bible. Why do generally people find this um, worse than thinking about why is Michael J. Fox so f***ing happy? I mean, oh, okay. his life's getting tough. He falls a lot. He talks different and his knees are killing him. And you know what? It wouldn't change a thing. All of the firstborn uh, in Egypt being killed. Or, I mean, there's some really atrocious things that have happened previously. Why, why is this considered any worse? That's a good question. And, and you know, and I, I in, in that line, Nancy, I immediately turn as well to the story of Noah's Ark. Which, yeah. to me, which to me is an even more violent text yeah. because it's not just the destruction of one people, but it's like we're murdering everyone except for eight people. Um, and and, everything. And everything. I mean, all the animal, everything. We're just wiping it out. And I mean, I, I think, you know, um, well, the first answer is I have no I have no clue. And so you should probably just quit this course right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um but the second thing is there's something I think about the way that this one is just seems so divinely mandated. And then not only does God mandate it, but God wants his people to carry it out as opposed to the flood that God carries out. And God says, if you don't carry it out, these horrible things are going it's to, it's like layer upon layer upon layer, um, which makes it, but I agree with you, Nancy, that, you know, I think a lot of the issues we have with this, you know, can be really set aside other violent texts um, within the Bible. I mean, a really good, you know, if I was going to do a class that wasn't an intro to the Hebrew Bible where I'm trying to do a survey of everything, a really good class would be how do we understand war and violence in Christian scriptures, looking both at the Hebrew Bible and the Greek scriptures, and how do we make sense of all of that as Christians? Um, um, But that would be another, you know, 37 session class probably in and of itself. Um, So... You're welcome. Cool. To- Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it, but I think you're right that your what we see in Deuteronomy is a natural conclusion of what we see in other texts. It's um, a rising of, uh, of um, uh, it's a concentration of theological themes we see in other texts. And so it can't really be seen entirely apart. I think, I think a lot of this in the end is an ancient people wrestling with their understanding of God and faithfulness and what that looks like, given what power looks like in the ancient world. Because the ancient world, of course, was much more violent than our own modern world, at least our own modern world as we experience it insulated in 21st century America, right? We, we all know that this kind of violence and horror still happens all the time in the world. 
Um, but we just see it on the news and therefore it doesn't shock us as much, unfortunately. So, well, that's a depressing point to end on. Um, but let's drive forward anyways and see what we can't learn. So um, really primarily today, I'm gonna deal with this first section of Moses's second address because there's so much that goes on in these first chapters of the second address, chapters five through seven. So before we get into the text itself, just some key points I wanna make to you. Um, it claims that this is largely a retelling of Exodus 19 through 20, right? This is just like, Moses is like, so we're at Horeb and this is what happened. Horeb and Sinai being, remember, the same thing. Horeb is what Sinai is called in the Deuteronomistic tradition. Um, but though it claims to be that, there's actually, there are changes in the theology and the detail of what happens. And so being attentive to those changes in Deuteronomy, how, how, it, how it's different than Exodus, will be helpful to us in trying to understand what's going on in Deuteronomy. Note as well that this is not a mixed group. This is a, 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 an address given to the people of Israel, whereas in Exodus 12, 38, it's given to the people of Israel and the other mixed people who, who traveled with them, the actual language there. Let me bring that up so I can uh, quote it accurately as opposed to in my memory, um, which is probably a better idea. Um, uh, so Exodus 12, 38. A mixed crowd also went up with them and livestock in great numbers, both flocks and herds. And so in Exodus, it's not just the Israelites. Exodus is probably reflecting the more authentic earlier tradition that the Hebrews were not some kind of established nation. They were this nomadic people who eventually became a nation. And so there are lots of Hebrews with the idea that Hebrew was actually just a slang term for migrant pr probably in that time. Um, and so Deutero Exodus kind of reflects that tradition, whereas by the time of Deuteronomy, they're looking back and thinking, oh, no, we were one complete nation at that point, which is likely massively anachronistic and not true. Um, essential as well in Deuteronomy is that God discloses this law to the people. Um, it's very, 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 very relational. Also, several times in the, in the commandments, particularly in the Decalogue, the, the text uses the singular you as opposed to the plural you. That's always tricky because in English, right, you've got you and you've got you. Um, unless you live in the South, then you've got you and y'all. Or if you live in certain parts of the South, you have you and y'all and all y'all, uh, which are all different, <laughs> right? Y'all and all y'all. Some of you know the difference between that. Um, in, in Spanish, you've got, you know, to or usted, and then you've got ustedes. But in English, we don't have that. We, in, in the Midwest, we'd have you guys. So what we've got going on here is God is not saying you guys do this. God is saying you singular do this, which is a contrast to what you find in other ancient Near Eastern codes of conduct. Most ancient Near Eastern codes of conduct are you plural, you as a people, you as a nation, you as a group, but that's different in Deuteronomy. It's you as an individual following this law. So that's a really important um, distinction to note before we dive into the text itself. Also, obedience as it exists in these early chapters of the second address is about active respect for the integrity of the neighbor, no matter who that neighbor is, whether they are your kinsman, whether they're the alien, whether they are um, uh, the soldier, whatever that kinsman might be, it's about active respect for the integrity of that person. That's a theme you'll see kind of running throughout Deuteronomy um, that, that begins right here in this second address. So as we begin, if you want to flip to Deuteronomy uh, chapter five, um, the past uh, is sought to be made um, present, interestingly enough. Um, so in uh, chapter five, beginning in verse one, and Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today, you shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord, our God, has made a covenant Made a covenant with us at Horeb, not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you at the face of the mountain, out of the fire. At that time, I was standing before the Lord and you to declare to you the words of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, and then we'll get into that. Um, so know how interesting. So Moses is saying that covenant made at Horeb was not actually made with the people at Horeb, which is 
a massive theological jump Moses is making. Moses is saying, well, clearly the people at Horeb were a bunch of failures and losers who couldn't obey God. And so that covenant was never made with them. That covenant was clearly instead made with us, the, the new generation, the faithful generation about to enter the land. Um, so that's a, he, he, this ability to kind of take the covenant at Horeb and then transplant it by saying, uh, God wasn't talking to them. God was talking to us. Is a big theological jump Moses is making in Deuteronomy, which is very, very important to know. Um, does that make sense? Questions? You're also seeing immediately here a tension that winds up existing throughout Deuteronomy between whether God made this covenant directly with the people or whether Moses functions as a mediator. And you see that even, it's likely that there are probably varying traditions about this because it says in verse four, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain. And then verse five, but I was standing between the Lord and you to declare because you were afraid. So was the Lord speaking face to face to the people or was Moses functioning as the mediator? The answer being yes, no, we don't know. Those are two distinct traditions that exist in Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is kind of wrestling with those traditions and we'll wrestle with them a bit more as we get a little bit farther down in this text. Questions, comments? Very exciting stuff. Uh, and then the deck, we get the Decalogue and the Decalogue, we get it in a reframed uh, form. So beginning in uh, chapter six, so and God said, and he said, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And then, of course, all of the right one Episcopalians respond, uh, Lord, have mercy and incline our hearts to keep thy law, right? Something like that. Uh, that, was a, that was a joke for Carolyn, primarily. Um, I think it's <laughs> uh, You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, that's not what it says. What? Punishing, punishing children and the inequities of their parents. Come on, Father. <laughs> Stick to the text. That's what it says. <laughs> where? Where does it say that? Verse 9. Oh, I must have a different Bible than you. <laughs> yeah, you've got you've to get a better translation because it literally says that, which is massively unsettling, right? Punishing children for the yeah. iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation. Wow. That means if your great granddaddy was a kind of an ass and didn't follow God, you're going to be punished. So sucks to be you. Um, yeah, sorry, not buying that one. But, okay. <laughs> but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me. Great news there. So a thousand generations before you, if you had someone that was faithful, God will still love you. So there's a little nuance going on there. Uh, you uh, continue out of the commandment. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. For the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or your female or your ox. Don't make your ox or your donkey work. How dare you on the Sabbath? You mean per any of your livestock? The resident alien, that's the immigrant, and you don't even make them work. You can't, you can't go and pick up immigrants to come frame your house for you on the Sabbath day. You're a horrible human being. Of course not. Your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you so that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, neither shall you commit adultery, neither shall you steal, neither shall you bear false witness against your neighbor, neither shall you cover your neighbor's wife, neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So this is the as far as I was going right. Yeah, this is the restatement. But what's fascinating about the Decalogue as it exists in Deuteronomy is it's different than the way it exists in Exodus. So a few things to note. Number one, 
punishment for sin as 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 much much the annoyance of of Matt of Matthew praying crosses generations. So the reason for this is they're trying to explain why it is that we lost the land. Um, and it was it was not just the failure of one of us, but it was the failure of our ancestors before us. And what you see as well is that this idea is carried through into the book of Nehemiah, which is, of course, is, is likely a, a book that's pretty close to contemporary with Deuteronomy, where the people come together and they do this whole communal repentance for the sins of their ancestors. I want to talk about that for a second. So I remember um, in the, my intro to the Hebrew Bible class that I used to, that I used to tutor, um, David Fadir would talk about this in the section on Nehemiah, and I'll, I'll get to it a bit then, but it's a good point to raise here um, about some of the actual horrors of slavery that happened. Um, horrible, horrible things. Not just the selling of people, the destruction of families, um, the rape of slaves, um, all of this stuff. Um, and the fact that the reason that people who are white have it a little bit easier today is because of the horrors done by our ancestors. Um, and David would always end this lecture by saying, don't you think that we should maybe say sorry? Someone should stand up and say, I'm sorry for what my grandparents or my great grandparents or my parents did. I'm sorry. And I know what I have is because of that horror. And therefore I need to do something. And this was his, basically his sermon for reparations. Um, and if you think I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a horrible person for suggesting reparations, and uh, I would really commend you Ta-Nehisi's coat, Ta-Nehisi Coates books on the case, on the case for reparations. Um, and what, how it is that sin can be generational and the culpability for sin can be generational as well. Because that's really what God, I think is going on in Deuteronomy. It's not this, people think this is about this like vengeful, angry God. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think this is, this is God being honest about that. There is some sort, there is some sin that is a generational reality. And that's not simply questions of racism. Um, probably most of you have either friends or family members who have dealt with generational issues surrounding abuse, surrounding alcohol. Um, all of this stuff is generational. Um, and the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. Um, and so the first thing to know is that, and, and that, that the people are saying that, you know, the loss of the land, and this is also a graceful reality. The reason it wasn't just our fault alone. It was because our parents and our ancestors had also been unfaithful. And I don't think that's trying to, to kind of avoid taking, um, responsibility for their failures. I think it's an acknowledgement that the sins of the people that led to the loss of the land were generational and coming. And that means it wasn't just you, you were led down this path by your, by your ancestors. But the flip side of that in Deuteronomy is that sin goes three, maybe four generations, but mercy goes a thousand generations. And I think that's the other essential thing to catch here. When you think this is about some vengeful, angry God, I think what God is doing is acknowledging that the consequences for our sins often do persist in several generations, but that God's mercy can overcome that into thousands of generations. So I want to pause because this is a huge point made in Deuteronomy that is, that is difficult, particularly for a modern you know, American you know, I'm it's just me and my own two cents kind of sort of mentality to, to deal with. But um, it's a it, it's a, it's an important part of the text. Comments, questions, thoughts. Yeah, actually, I think the parallels to our current situation in the United States are very, very in this text. Um, for years, we have been and still to this day, and people can disagree, we have slavery in our nation. Um, we have disadvantaged people who we keep disadvantaged. And if you look to some places, not Michigan, but down South, it's a generational thing where they will be fully honest and say, these, aren't, these are not people equal of me, which is horrible, but it is what it is. And I don't think we've ever gotten past that point. So I guess we got three or four more generations of pain before we get to a thousand generations of happiness. 
Right. I think you're right. And this is what, you know, Jim Wallace's book about America's original sin that we did our book study on last year, I think nails it on the head. The, a lot of what we're wrestling with as a country is the fact that we have not yet dealt appropriately and faithfully to the question surrounding slavery and race in our country. And so we're still wrestling with that. And so for me, I find in Deuteronomy a, a remarkably like appropriate, like it, it, it nails it right on the head, the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Nancy, you look like you have something to say. No, I was just changing the mute to unmute. Ah, okay. Um, the other thing I'd say here is um, that steadfast love to the thousandth generation, that's, that, that, that's not you know, like an affection. That, that's a covenant loyalty. This is that chesed, which is the Hebrew word. There, there, I used to joke that I wanted to do a version of the Hebrew Bible that took like 25 words in Hebrew that are not properly translatable and would only ever transliterate those words. So when you saw chesed, you knew that was chesed, which means like lots of things. And you wouldn't just think that it's this or that or the other. Um, so that, that chesed, that steadfast, is not like, oh, I love you so much, give me a hug. But it's about a covenant loyalty, a, a fidelity, a faithfulness that a sovereign would have for a vassal state in, in the ancient Near East. Um, and that, that is the covenant loyalty that God now is showing to the people of Israel, which remember that this is subversive. Because we, we don't get that covenant loyalty by bowing to any empire. We get that by bowing to God. So there's, there's a subversive movement going on here. Other things you know, that are kind of in the reframing that are different is in Exodus, the Sabbath is remembered, while in Deuteronomy, the, the Sabbath is kept. This is very important. Exodus, it says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And in, the reason in Exodus is because of creation. For in six days the Lord, Lord created, and on the seventh day God rested. In Deuteronomy, it's keep the Sabbath day. So it's about the actions you're going to do, the way you're going to live in response to the Sabbath day. And you do it not because of creation, but because you were once a slave. You know what it is like to be an oppressed people, and therefore you will give to oppressed people in your own time, people that are struggling, people that are marginalized, you will give them this day of rest. Uh, so a very different reason for Sabbath and a very different method of, of, of honoring the Sabbath, not just remembering it intellectually, but keeping it with the actions you take. Um, also, interestingly enough, the prohibition on coveting in Exodus, and Exodus says don't covet. But in, in, in Deuteronomy, it adds on top of that, do not desire. So to covet is to see something, to like it, and then to want it for yourself. Um, but but ex, in some ways, Deuteronomy is kind of like the, the Sermon on the Mount. It backs it up. Don't even look at it to want it. Like much less the, the covet of it. Don't even desire it. Like it, it just makes it even uh, more drawn back in terms of the the, the, str the stricture placed upon you by the law. Um, questions, thoughts. I mean, the, the, you like I said, you could do a whole session just on the Decalogue and Exodus compared to Deuteronomy, of course. But I hope that gives you kind of a sense of some of what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing that Christ changed all these rules. <laughs> went maybe he died on the cross for us he changed maybe. a lot of them. maybe <laughs> maybe we'll see <laughs> sorry i skipped ahead right you skipped that no, no spoiler alert so um and then you get in verses 22 through 33 kind of a read Oops, off my screen sure i'm sorry ah my powerpoint closed a second I'm told there was an error with my computer. Well, I think you're an error with my computer. <laughs> uh, I got to go let my dog in. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Is that really pink? All right. It looks very pink. It's just the lighting. Maybe. All right. Uh, back to Zoom. Turn screen sharing back on where we are right now. 
All right. So Moses, um, we talked about this earlier about this idea that Moses is the, this, you know, did, did God speak with the people face to face or was it Moses? So in verse 22, we hear these words, the Lord spoke with a loud voice to your whole assembly at the mountain out of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness. And he added no more. He wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you approached me, all the heads of your tribe and your elders. And you said, Look, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the fire. Today we have seen that God may speak to someone and the person may live. So now why should we die for this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer? We shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the fire as we have and remained alive? Go near you yourself and hear all the Lord our God will say. Then tell us everything the Lord our God tells you, and we will listen and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I've heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you, and they are right in all that they have spoken, which they have spoken to you. Um, if only they had such a mind as this to fear me and to keep all my commandments always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents. But you, Moses, stand here by me, and I will teach. I will tell you all the commandments, the statutes, and ordinances that you shall teach them, so that they may do them in the land that I am giving to them to possess. You must therefore be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded to you. You shall not turn to the right or to the left. You must follow exactly the path that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you are to possess. Uh, so the Decalogue seems in Deuteronomy to be given directly to the people. But the rest of the law, at least this section, seems to say that it's mediated through Moses at their request. And like I said, that's not really clear because it did say at the very beginning that God spoke to the people face to face and then that, God, that Moses was the mediator. So there's probably two contrasting traditions about what happened going on here. But if you want to stick with what the canon later wound up saying, it seems to say that the Decalogue was direct, but what follows after that is mediated. The reason for that probably being to justify Moses's exposition on the laws in this text, to justify his prophecies, his additions, because the rest of Deuteronomy, as, we, as we'll discover, if you thought the Ten Commandments were a reframing, the rest of Deuteronomy is an even larger reframing of what we saw in Exodus. And so this idea that Moses is given this authority as mediator is to undergird that he is the divinely authorized person, not only to interpret the law, but also to reframe and recast the law, contrary to the earlier Exodus. <laughs> so that's, that, that's some of what perhaps going on there in those last verses. And then we get in verse, uh, verses, uh, chapter six, verses one through nine, um, the, after, the beginning of the law following the uh, 10 commandments. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe the land that you're about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and the commandments I'm commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey <coughs> as the Lord, the God of your ancestors has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with, and with all your mind. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Um, so the statute and ordinances are what function as the law in Deuteronomy. The statutes that we get in chapter 6 through 11 and the ordinances that we get in chapters 12 to 26. Both of those, the source of both of those is the is what God has given to the people at Horeb, is what's being argued here at the beginning of chapter 6. That, that, that word, fear the Lord your God, I always want to remind people a better translation of that in the Hebrew is revere to have reverence, honor, show respect for. It's not about being, you know, knees knocking scared as it is about recognizing the power and, and the majesty of God. Uh, this entire section really is an expanded discourse on the first commandment, though. 
about the oneness of God and the singleness of God compared to uh, compared to you know idols or other gods. Um, that's really this whole section is an expansion on that first commandment, almost like the first midrash on that commandment. Verse four begins what's known in uh, in Judaism as the Sh- as the Shema, um, which literally in Hebrew means here Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, any Jewish child, any Jewish person can recite that in Hebrew, even to this day. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. This is the center of, uh, of, Jude, of Jewish faith. Um, it, it's an apparent, that imperative here, Shema, is really modeled upon the wisdom tradition. We see that happening throughout um, uh, wisdom literature, that call to, to hear, to listen. You'd also hear that in Orthodox liturgy often, where before the reading of scripture, they'll say, wisdom, let us attend, which I've always loved. That that's where you introduce scripture in the Orthodox tradition. Instead of a reading from blah, 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 it's wisdom, let us attend. Pay attention, right? I know the emphasis, though, uh, is on a relationship with God. It's not God in the abstract, some kind of random being. Um, but that is um, that it is the Lord your God is your God, and that, that God is going to care for you. God is going to take care of you. That 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 that's all presupposed in those first verses before you get to the Shema. So we we believe the Lord our God is the only God because that Lord has revealed Himself to us so very distinctly by caring for us. Love is not a private emotion in the Shema. It is an act of loyalty to God and neighbor. And we'll see that played out as we go through the rest of Deuteronomy. What it means to love God is to be loyal to God in the way you live, uh, to be loyal as well to your neighbor in the way you live. Um, that'll be brought out later in Deuteronomy. And that you should take these commandments and bind them to your forehead, to your, to your doorpost, all of this. This is explaining the convention of what are known as phylacteries. So you may, the, 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 the or, literally Orthodox Jews will still today like bind with straps to their head, these boxes that contain little scrolls of scripture or the mezuzot, the mezuzah that you may have seen on Jewish households, kind of that uh, nailed in kind of an angle shape on their doorpost that contain the words of the Torah. It's, it's likely that that practice of binding words of the Torah on your head or on your arms or sticking out of your doorpost was likely probably originally had some kind of magical idea that, you know, that this will protect us from evil and that what's happening in Deuteronomy is we don't want to say that this is magic. We want to say that this is religion. It's about reminding us of God's words. But at the same time, even to this day, thousands of years later, um, if you ask the average Jewish person why they have a mezuzah on their door, it will be to keep our house from evil, um, which is, of course, not just something Jewish people do. Of course, um, I don't know if any of you uh, went and got your chalk from St. John's to go ahead and mark on your doorpost on Epiphany 20 plus M plus C plus B plus 21, the Epiphany inscription for may God bless this house that we do every year on our doorpost as, as Christians. Um, so all of these things, you, you can see them as a magical thinking that I'll do this and then evil won't come. Or you can see it as a ritual reenactment that reminds me of faithfulness. And um, it's likely what Deuteronomy is doing here is taking an existing ritual reality and trying to give it a, a, deeper, um, a deeper truth. And then what happens in the rest of chapter six is the dangers of disloyalty. Um, what's going to happen if you don't go ahead and um, do this. And, and he's told that um, when God gives you this land um, with cities, with houses, it'll have houses, cisterns, you, houses you did not fill, hewn cisterns you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. When you've eaten your fill, what that's describing there is an established civilization. The Israel is both to inherit and to become. And they're told, don't test God the same way you did at Massa, it says in verse 16. Um, yeah. That's actually a pun. The word for test and the word for Massa have the same consonants in Hebrew. Um, so there's a little pun going on there. It's less funny in English. Um, yeah. And the questions that begin in verse 20, when your children ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of these decrees and statutes that the Lord has commanded you? Then you shall say to your children, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So this is the basis of the Passover, even in modern Judaism today, where the littlest child says, "What? why is this night different from all other nights? 
Um, that, and then you tell them the story of God's rescue. And so the, the thing to note here is the law, the covenant is based upon this personal relationship with the God who has rescued us from our slavery in the land of Egypt. And then you get the war of conquest. I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm going to try to cover this real briefly since we did a little bit of it. This is another chiasm. Destroy the Canaanites is A. God chose you because of his promise. So obey the law is B. B prime. When you obey, God will keep the promise to your fathers and bless you. And A prime, then God will destroy the Canaanites before you. So the, the chiastic structure going on here, emphasizing, remember, the center of the chiasm being fidelity to the law. Um the nations are, that are listed here, these seven nations, are probably are not historical. These seven is wholeness. This is not probably these are not the, the, the specific seven nations they defeated. For example, the Hittite Empire did not even exist in Canaan. They existed in Anatolia, central Turkey. Um, so these nations are reflecting later kind of reimaginings of this time. This is not a historical telling. And of course, the great line for me also, we always with this, with the Jebusites is, um, um, oh, who, uh, who was it? And I'm going to, I'm going to lose the name. Um, Beekner, Frederick Beekner, his great line was, um, no one comes to church on Sunday, what, on Sunday, wondering what happened to the Jebusites which is, of course, one of the nations in this text. And so your task as a preacher is not to get so caught up on what happened to the Jebusites, but to give people good news. That's just a little aside that has nothing to do with this text. But remember, earlier sources in Exodus, for example, emphasize the expulsion. Imagine the expulsion of these nations, not the destruction of these nations. So remember that this rhetoric is a later development in the rhetoric, not really reflected in the more ancient sources. Uh, they're called not to intermarry with these nations, which kind of means you probably didn't destroy them all if you could still marry them. And the risk there is due to the risk of idolatry, that if we marry them, then we'll probably wind up beginning to follow their gods, which is what we, of course, want to avoid. Um, that ban, this ban all is like, likely an anachronistic literary formation that exists in Deuteronomy that re represents the time it's written much more so than the time in which Deuteronomy actually took place. And then there will be rewards for obedience. Um, note that the, the war rewards for obedience in chapter 7 are blessings of fertility. Not from the Canaanite gods. Canaanite gods were often uh, fertility gods. But in this text, it says Yahweh is the one who will bless you with children, will multiply your descendants. So you can compare, for example, this text with the way the Canaanite god Astarte or Asherah is described in 1 Kings. Um, god is also present in battle. Um, as we see, this is a God is going to be present with them, which is echoing the presence of God in Exodus 23. So that's that's the conquest. We're a little past our time, but we'll go ahead and turn the screen sharing off. That's a lot to cover, and you can see why I thought my whole idea of getting all of Deuteronomy was simply foolish, that I could do the rest of it today. But that's that first kind of chunk of the first discourse. Questions, comments, thoughts? Uh one of my Bibles uh, has a couple of uh, like side essays <clears throat> that put a considerable amount of emphasis on the Assyrian Empire and a, something called the Treaty of Esarhaddon, which I missed the first 20 minutes, so I don't know if you mentioned that or not, but uh, apparently the, there are some uh, similarities between Deuteronomy and, and the, the, the conditions imposed by the Assyrian Empire and it kind of made me wonder how much of this uh, ethnic hatred was basically imposed by the Assyrians, um, that, like good King Josiah died in battle fighting on behalf of his Assyrian overlord. Yeah. Um, and that's apparently about when a lot of Deuteronomy was written. Yeah, you, you, you're not wrong, Scott. I mean, that's probably a lot of this is that. It, it, it's also a subversive text at the same time, because though the covenant code of Deuteronomy mimics a lot of what we see in the Treaty of Asarhaddon, it's different because the fealty, the loyalty in Deuteronomy is not to the sovereign empire, but is to God. And so it's this really interesting way of taking what exists in, in culture and then subverting it by saying, but our faithfulness does not belong to Assyria, but belongs okay. to God. And I think you're right that there are some aspects of that covenant code 
which are clearly much more Syrian in practice than we would rep, rep like the the the, uh, the the stuff about battle and violence, and we would rep see as being authentically um, authentically true to the Jewish to the Hebrew scriptures. Um, but there is at the same time that it's trying to subvert that narrative and at the same time struggling to because okay. that is the narrative of what you do, right? Oh, okay, I can see a similarity to where Paul appropriated Roman titles for Augustus and he called Jesus the son of God, right? Uh, Etc. Et exactly, exactly, yeah. Other comments, questions, thoughts before we wrap up tonight? No, I just, it, it's amazing when you read this and you look at modern day Israel, it's almost like they have not, not changed. Yeah, and that's one of the, the reasons why these questions of conquest narrative, it's very hard because a lot of this forms the basis of the um, invasion of Palestine in the middle of the 20th century and the continuing occupation of the Palestinian lands. Um, and so on one side, you want to read this critically not saying that this makes what happened to Palestine and what's currently happening in the apart, I would say the apartheid state of Palestine, that this is not okay. On the other side, you don't want to go so far that you wind up veering into anti Semitism, which is what Christianity has also done. Um, and so it's, it's, it's this delicate balance we have to walk in terms of being faithful, which is to be willing to have a critical approach to the modern nation state of Israel while at the same time affirming the role of Judaism and the God, you know, the, 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 the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. The scriptures are very, are very clear on that. We are the ones grafted on. And so it's a lot to unpack and struggle with, but the way that, do, that these texts intersect with modern geopolitics in the Holy Land is hard, absolutely. Well, thank you all. This has been a lot of fun, Barbara. I hope that this uh, did not scare you away from future, future sessions, but you'll come back and be with us again. Yes. Uh, good. And we'll, next, I'll send out an email um, next week with, with a reminder for readings, but most likely it'll be what I told you to read for this week um, that we didn't cover. <laughs> oh, Got it. Yep. Right. So thank you all. Have a good night. God bless you. Bye. Good night.